As a species, we tend to romanticize our planet's watery nature. We refer to it as the blue planet, the blue marble, or the pale blue dot. The roiling, bounding main sloshing over its surface gives the impression that our planet is misnamed and that it would have been far more aptly christened water. But this gossamer blue cloak is an illusion. Taken as a whole, our planet's water is little more than a wisp of steam cooling on the surface of a burning rock. If one were to choose a more suitable moniker for our world, it would be magma. The same is true throughout the so-called inner solar system. Until you reach the outer rim of the asteroid belt, water remains a tasteful decoration daubing bodies of rock and metal. At around three times Earth's distance from the Sun, however, that begins to change. Ceres, the largest asteroid, is about 30% water by mass, and the outer rim of the belt is home to its own population of icy comets. The moons of Jupiter and Saturn, as I have shown, are replete with water, but within the planets themselves, water appears virtually absent, with Jupiter's atmosphere registering it at parts per million, and Saturn's parts per billion. There may be a substantial amount of water hidden beneath the planet's surface clouds, but despite having slammed a probe into Jupiter at thousands of miles per hour, we appear to have missed it. Some believe that this was due to bad luck, and that the probe happened to hit a desert between Jupiter's cloud belts. That may be so, but it will be a long time before we find out. Beyond Jupiter and Saturn, however, there lies another realm, one whose planets are truly worthy of the name water. This region of our solar system was only comparatively recently discovered. Unlike the planets before it, redolent with myths and magic, those of this realm were products of modern industrial civilization. The first of these worlds, Uranus, is just visible to the naked eye, but moves so slowly that it went unnoticed for the first 6,000 years of human civilization. Its discovery, by renowned astronomer William Herschel, came two years before the launch of the first steamboat and hot air balloon, while Urban Le Verrier's discovery of Neptune nearly coincided with the invention of the first electric battery and artificial fertilizer. They were the first planets found in the era of Newton, and so were subject from the beginning to rigorous scientific investigation. I've already discussed the discovery of these two worlds in another video series, so in this video I will focus on how our understanding of their natures evolved as each world gradually revealed both its similarities and its peculiarities to our ever keener eyes. This increased understanding would, however, take centuries to grow. All that could initially be determined about them was that, while larger than Earth, they were far less massive than Jupiter and Saturn. The first step would be uncovering the nature of matter itself. When Uranus was discovered, chemistry was still in its infancy. Hydrogen, the dominant element in the universe, had only been isolated 15 years before. Newton had allowed for the calculation of a planet's density, but without any way of determining composition, such information was, as William Herschel put it, of no other use than merely to satisfy our curiosity. By the mid-19th century, a new device, the spectrograph, was conveying to us the physical nature of the celestial bodies through light. Astronomy is, for all intents and purposes, the study of light. Unless it comes to us, usually via meteorite, our understanding of the universe beyond our sky is mediated entirely through the light emitted by the objects within it. The spectrograph, for the first time, allowed us to dissect that light into its individual components. Every substance in the universe absorbs or emits light at a specific set of frequencies and by smearing out an object's light into its component frequencies, a spectrograph allowed you to read those absorption or emission lines like a barcode, and, assuming you had a record of the substance back on Earth, identify the specific color for every substance in the universe. The luminaries of our sky, long thought to be unknowable or of matter beyond our perishable terrestrial understanding, were revealing themselves to be just as earthly as our own world and the man who first brought that light to us was not the first you would necessarily predict. Father Angelo Secchi lies near the top of the sadly expansive list of great astronomers most people have never heard of. Much like that of Gregor Mendel and other men of God who made indelible marks on science, 
His life makes a mockery of the conflict narrative between science and religion so popular on both sides today. Ordained in 1847, in 1850 he became head of the Vatican Observatory. Yes, that is a thing. Secchi did not invent the spectrograph, but, like Galileo with the telescope, was the first to adapt it for astronomical observation. He realized that stars were composed mainly of hydrogen, and was the first to classify stars by their spectral type. One such spectral type, he noticed, was essentially identical to that seen in the Sun, proving that the Sun was a star. But when he turned his eye to the planets, in particular the newly discovered planets Uranus and Neptune, he found a series of spectral bands that weren't in the Sun's spectrum. When Secchi first observed Uranus, he had to double-check his telescope to ensure there was no malfunction. It seemed all the colors below yellow were missing. It took nearly a hundred years and the extension of spectroscopy into the infrared before astronomers, among them Vesto Slifer of the Lowell Observatory, identified the mysterious substance for what it was, methane. So completely did the methane in their atmospheres absorb red that it left both of those planets a stark, vivid, greenish blue. By the 20th century, observations of the rotations of Jupiter and Saturn had determined their moment of inertia, essentially the resistance an object has to being sped up or slowed down. The higher an object's moment of inertia, the more its mass is concentrated towards its core. Observations determined that Jupiter and Saturn were more concentrated toward their cores than even Earth, and that, combined with their density, meant that the bulk of their makeup could only consist of the lightest possible elements, hydrogen and helium. With Uranus and Neptune, however, such studies suggested that hydrogen and helium would comprise just a small outer envelope, and that they, in the vast majority, consisted of heavier volatile substances like water, methane, and ammonia, possibly compressed into a superheated liquid ocean. The idea that Uranus and Neptune may consist largely of a liquid water ocean with ammonia and methane flavoring has persisted for some time, and is supported by the observations in their upper atmospheres, which show an abundance of certain materials indicative of aqueous chemistry. The planet's inner rocky cores were larger as a proportion of their size than Jupiter and Saturn's. Initially, these four were referred to collectively simply as the giant planets. But in 1957, a now all but forgotten science fiction writer named James Blish coined the now classic descriptor, gas giants. But even so, it was clear that among these gas giants, Uranus and Neptune were markedly different from Jupiter and Saturn. The most obvious difference was, of course, their mass. Jupiter is over 300 times the mass of the Earth, while Saturn is nearly 100 times Earth's mass. Uranus and Neptune, by contrast, are 14 and 17 Earth masses, respectively. Also, Jupiter and Saturn's atmospheres are composed overwhelmingly of hydrogen and helium, with other substances barely registering. Uranus and Neptune's atmospheres, by contrast, only comprise about 97% hydrogen and helium, with the largest additional component being, naturally, methane. In fact, Uranus and Neptune's atmospheres possess 30 times as much carbon as the Sun or the other giant planets. Ammonia has been found in the atmospheres of Jupiter and Saturn, but not in Uranus and Neptune. Some astronomers speculate that at those planets' temperatures, ammonia would freeze out and fall to lower depths, while others have suggested a more novel solution. Hydrogen sulfide, or rotten egg gas, is present on Uranus and Neptune, and ammonia could combine with hydrogen sulfide to form ammonium hydrosulfide, the same substance used in stink bombs. Uranus and Neptune are also nearly the same size, with just a 3% difference in their diameters, granting the more massive Neptune a higher density. As such, some astronomers suggested that the planets of our solar system be grouped on a tripartite basis, with one group comprising the terrestrial planets, another Jupiter and Saturn, and a third Uranus and Neptune. But for most of the remainder of the century, the inclusive term gas giant would remain the dominant descriptor for all four objects. The last two planets in our solar system have had only one visitor from Earth to date, the hardy probe Voyager 2, which flew by Uranus and Neptune in 1986 and 1989, respectively. As well as providing far better moments of inertia data, Voyager 2 revealed that the two outer planets shared one monumentally odd feature, their magnetic fields. Prior to Voyager 2, ground-based observers had glimpsed only hints of possible magnetic fields around these worlds. Voyager 2 confirmed them. To be clear, 
A magnetic field by itself is not odd. All of the planets, with the possible exception of Venus, either have or have had magnetic fields. Our own Earth has a particularly fine one, which has done a bang-up job protecting us from solar radiation. It is also offset from its axis of rotation by just 11 degrees, which is handy for hiking. Jupiter's is even closer, and Saturn's is almost true north. Uranus and Neptune's magnetic fields, on the other hand, look almost broken. Rather than tidally close to their planet's rotation axes, they appear to dangle like loose teeth, with Neptune's magnetic field offset by 47 degrees, and Uranus's by 59 degrees. Not only that, but they were also offset from the center of their planets, by a third of a radius in the case of Uranus, and half a radius in the case of Neptune. In order to generate a full magnetic field, a planet needs a convecting, electrically conductive fluid in its interior. For Earth, that fluid is liquid iron, which surrounds its solid inner core. For Jupiter and Saturn, that fluid is believed to be a bizarre form of super-dense liquid hydrogen, in which the protons form a structured lattice and electrons flow throughout, like they do in metals. This metallic hydrogen is believed to form at pressures above 250,000 atmospheres, which, according to models, exist on Jupiter and Saturn. These regions of electrically conducting fluid are comfortably close to their planet's cores, which explains why they are so closely aligned with their planet's rotation axes. So what explains the wild magnetic fields of Uranus and Neptune? It is known that both lack metallic hydrogen, but models suggest that they may possess another conductive fluid in their interiors, not located in a nice ball toward the center, but in a vast, thin shell midway from their cores. Uranus and Neptune could be up to 50% water, and at pressures of half a million atmospheres and temperatures above 1,000 kelvins, water becomes ionized, splitting into electrically charged H3O and OH ions. One of the more fascinating predictions of this high-pressure environment is that any methane present will eventually be stripped of its carbon, and that carbon will be crushed into diamond, which will hail down into the planet's cores. Experiments at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory have suggested that the base of the water mantle may be home to a white-hot sea of liquid diamond, dotted with floating diamondbergs. Astronomers and planetary scientists employ a particular shorthand for describing materials in the solar system based on their state during its formation. Anything that was gaseous throughout the original solar disk, such as hydrogen, helium, or neon, is, unsurprisingly, called gas. Anything that was solid throughout, such as silica or iron, is called rock, and anything that existed is either solid or gas, depending on its distance from the sun, such as water, ammonia, methane, carbon monoxide, or hydrogen sulfide, astronomers call ice. These words have no bearing whatsoever on the state the material happens to be in now. The rock that makes up most of the Earth exists today as magma, a viscous, putty-like, semi-solid, and the water, ammonia, and methane in Uranus and Neptune exist primarily as a superheated fluid. Nonetheless, they are still referred to as rock and ice. By weight, Saturn and Jupiter are 70 and 80% gas and 15 and 10% ice. Uranus and Neptune are 5 and 12% gas and 60 and 70% ice. I have been unable to locate who precisely it was who originated the term, but by the mid-1990s, ice giants began appearing in the scientific literature in reference to Uranus and Neptune, with the term gas giants reserved for Jupiter and Saturn. Today, the term is universal and even applied to extrasolar or undiscovered planets. Planet 9 is believed to be an escaped ice giant. So, where did Uranus and Neptune come from? Why are they so much smaller than Jupiter and Saturn? The working hypothesis is that Jupiter and Saturn arrived early to the party, and were able to gorge themselves on the feast of available material, including vast amounts of hydrogen and helium. Uranus and Neptune formed later, after the massive eruptions from the violent young sun blasted away most of the hydrogen-helium, leaving them little to work with. This hypothesis works if one assumes that both Uranus and Neptune form far closer to the Sun, and its eruptions, than they are today, a hypothesis also supported by other evidence, such as the Nice model, which I discussed in my video on Planet Nine. A 2016 study of the outer reaches of extrasolar systems suggests that ice giant planets are common in these regions, 
providing more evidence for the model. However, there are still unanswered questions regarding ice giant formation. For one thing, Kepler data suggests that Neptune-sized objects are far more common than Jupiter-sized objects, and that our solar system is actually unusual in its relatively small number of them. Not what one would expect if ice giants were truly the ill-fed runts of the planetary litter. So, now that I've examined what ties the ice giants together, I must now examine what sets them apart. To do that, I will have to take a step back in time. One of the drawbacks of being the best in the world at what you do is that you tend to spend much of your time alone at the top. While in sports this isolation can be splendid and exhilarating, in science it is often a hindrance as all scientific discoveries must be checked, tested, and verified by one's peers before they can be accepted. For William Herschel, who was not only the best astronomer, but also the best telescope maker of his era, the loneliness was infuriating. Having discovered, quite by accident, the solar system's seventh planet in 1781, he went on to discover its two largest moons six years later. Forty years after that, Herschel's son John would muse that no telescope had yet observed the moons other than the one that had discovered them. This was not in fact true, as they had been observed as early as 1797 by Johann Schroeter, though the delay in verification was now long enough to raise doubts as to whether the moons existed at all. These doubts were far from groundless. For all his gifts, Herschel was not infallible. He also claimed to have discovered several other moons of his planet, as well as a faint ring, though they are now widely considered spurious. At the end of his paper announcing the discovery of the two moons, he tentatively suggested that they, quote, made a considerable angle to the ecliptic, unquote. In layman's terms, they appeared to orbit the planet sideways, moving from up to down, rather than from left to right. Not only that, but they appeared to have retrograde orbits, or orbits contrary to the order of the zodiac. In other words, if they were orbiting like normal moons, they would be moving right to left, rather than the predicted left to right. In 1829, despite not having observed the satellites himself, Pierre-Simon Laplace, arguably the greatest celestial mechanic since Newton, concluded that if the two moons orbited in a single plane, as Herschel claimed they did, then they must be orbiting in line with the planet's equator. In other words, if the moons were orbiting sideways, then Uranus was sideways too. Herschel himself apparently already noticed this, mentioning flattening at the poles in his paper in 1797 describing the discovery of the four, now believed spurious, moons. As late as the 20th century, doubts still remained about whether Uranus truly was a sideways planet. But we now know it is just that. In fact, Uranus is more than sideways, as its north pole hangs below the ecliptic plane by a full eight degrees, meaning it is essentially upside down, which is why the orbits of its moons appear retrograde. Imagine if a similar situation occurred on Earth, at the solstice, the entire northern or southern hemispheres would be subject to the same eternal day or night as the poles. The midnight sun or dawnless day would be seen in Miami or Rio. Uranus's distance from the sun means that these extreme seasons last not months, but decades. When Voyager 2 arrived at Uranus in January 1986, the planet was almost exactly at its solstice. Its southern hemisphere, the focus of Voyager 2's attention, was pointing directly toward the sun, while its northern hemisphere was still bathed in shadow, as it had been for 21 years. It's fair to say that the summer weather was less than dramatic. Much like its sister Voyager 1 had at Titan, and for exactly the same reason, Voyager 2 found a world hidden from the universe. No raging storms or speeding bands, but a featureless veil of smog. As with Titan, Energy from the sun had converted the methane in Uranus's atmosphere into more complex organic molecules, obscuring the features below. But at least Titan's smog had a grimy definition to it. Uranus was just nothing. A blank aquamarine disk, recalling a piece of conceptual art, as if nature itself were conspiring to look unnatural. Even at higher wavelengths, Uranus still appeared less than vibrant. The clouds appeared calm with no trace of lightning. That is not to say that Voyager 2 did not unearth any peculiarities with Uranus. For one thing, because its axis of rotation is so wildly different from any other planets, and because its magnetic field is so wildly offset from its axis of rotation, Uranus's magnetosphere is actually oriented very similarly to that of Jupiter, Saturn, or Earth, 
the only difference being that Uranus rolls like a bowling ball beneath it. This rolling actually twists the tail of Uranus's magnetic field into a massive, spinning helix. Last year, astronomers at Georgia Tech proposed that this rolling, tumbling magnetic field may once a day reconnect with the solar wind, the stream of particles from the sun from whose bombardments our own magnetic field protects us. This effectively creates a light switch on Uranus's magnetic field that means that particles from the sun can pass through and irradiate the surface. Another odd thing Voyager 2 discovered is that, despite the southern pole receiving almost all the sunlight, temperatures between the pole and the equator were hardly any different. In fact, Uranus was slightly hotter at the equator than the pole. It seems Uranus is very efficient at transporting heat. Which is slightly odd, because heat is something Uranus does not appear to have. Neptune is 11 AU further from the Sun than Uranus, which means it receives two and a half times less sunlight per meter. However, the two planets' surface temperatures are nearly identical. Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune all radiate far more energy than they receive from the Sun. However, Uranus emits barely more than it reflects back. No one knows for certain why Uranus is so cold, but some suspect it might be related to whatever event it was that knocked Uranus on its side. Conventional wisdom among astronomers is that Uranus must have been thwacked in its infancy by an exceptionally large object, likely several times bigger than Earth. But there had always been a problem with this idea. Such a sudden jolt would certainly bowl Uranus over, but its moons would be left following their original paths. But they don't. Whatever event tilted Uranus tilted the orbits of its moons along with it. In 2011, Alessandro Morbidelli, one of the great explorers of the outer reaches of the solar system and a co-creator of the Nice model, proposed an alternate model. Uranus was hit not once, but twice. When tweaked so that Uranus was the victim of two smaller collisions, rather than one big one, the model fit the facts. These two massive collisions would have driven massive amounts of material from the core of Uranus to its surface, causing it to release huge amounts of its primordial heat. Uranus, effectively, bled out. When Voyager 2 arrived at Neptune in 1989, the PR folks at NASA must have heaved a sigh of relief. Neptune had apparently dressed for the occasion with beautiful azure bands and cobalt storms backlit by electric blue swirls and framed by white Earth-like cirrus clouds composed of frozen methane. The most obvious feature observed by Voyager 2 was the Great Dark Spot. Up to that time, the only other great spot observed in our solar system besides the red one. Like the Great Red Spot, it is an anticyclone, a massive region of high pressure that was observed to oscillate in size by as much as 20% across 200 hours of observation. Unlike the Great Red Spot, the dark spot was surprisingly mobile, drifting by as much as 9 degrees of latitude over 5,000 hours. Another observed storm, called the Small Dark Spot, or, because astronomers are nerds, the Wizard's Eye, was observed in Neptune's southern hemisphere. The reason for Neptune's technicolor dream coat appeared self-explanatory. Unlike Uranus, Neptune radiated as much as two and a half times as much energy as it received from the Sun. Whatever heat had deserted Uranus in the past was still very present at Neptune, and this heat was enough to drive winds to supersonic speeds. In fact, Neptune's winds are faster than Jupiter's, despite receiving 20 times less solar energy. This may be because solar energy powers opposing eddies and currents that slow the winds down. Neptune has far more methane in its upper atmosphere than would seemingly be allowed by the vapor pressure at those altitudes, and far more than Uranus, an indication that Neptune's internal heat is pushing methane up from the depths. Recently, models have suggested that the weather region of the ice giants may be just 1,000 kilometers deep, barely 2% their radii, and 0.2% of their mass. Voyager 2's planetary mission ended at Neptune. In 1990, Voyager 1, which had been inactive since being diverted to Titan in 1980, turned its eye back toward home and snapped the famous pale blue dot image of the Earth. But after that, the Voyagers would be relegated to searching for the edge of the solar wind. But observations of Uranus and Neptune did not end with Voyager 2's departure, thanks to an, eventually, immeasurably powerful tool launched just a year later the Hubble Space Telescope. Denied any further close encounters, any new knowledge we would glean about Uranus and Neptune would come from Hubble. And by 1994, when Hubble turned its eye to Neptune, 
The planet appeared to respond to our ogling by, as we say in the UK, taking the utter mickey. To Hubble, Neptune appeared as bland and blank as Uranus. The great dark spot, the star of the Voyager 2 encounter, was nowhere to be found. And then, in 1995, a dark spot appeared again, only on the opposite side of the planet to the first one. Then it too disappeared. And then, in 2016, Hubble saw a third dark storm, this one back where the original had been. Then it began to fade, and by this year, it had completely vanished. It appears that the climate of Neptune is far more fickle than that of Jupiter, in which storms can rage for decades, or even centuries. Why this is may be due to Neptune's smaller internal heat flux, which lacks the energy to drive storms for as long as they persist on Jupiter. And Uranus? Uranus has had, if anything, an even more spectacular afterlife. Thanks to its shorter orbital period, we have now observed Uranus up close for one of its seasons, and, in 2006, as the planet approached its equinox, it suddenly cast off its veil and revealed itself as a green twin of Neptune, complete with its own dark spot. And as recently as 2014, the Keck Observatory in Hawaii saw Uranus's atmosphere erupt in violent storms. So perhaps internal heat is not the only player in the ice giant's climate. But if the ice giants are climatically alive worlds, is it possible that they could be literally alive as well? Could their watery interiors be home to living organisms? As tempting as it would be to say yes, there are some very heavy obstacles to such an idea. For one thing, such life would have to be able to withstand temperatures of up to 1000 K and pressures of at the very least thousands of atmospheres conditions beyond even the most resilient of known organisms. Also, models of the ice giant's internal chemistry suggest that, despite their makeup, their cores may be even more alien than those of the gas giants. Recent calculations have shown that on Neptune at least, internal temperatures are too high for water to condense into a liquid. Other simulations since 1988 have suggested that much of the water in Uranus and Neptune may exist in the form of superionic ice a hyperdense ice in which liquid hydrogen moves through a solid oxygen lattice. Hardly the warm little pond of Darwin's imagination. But again, all of this is speculation. Until we send a probe into an ice giant's clouds, rugged enough to withstand the extreme conditions, we can never know for sure. <sighs> okay. That was a script and a half. I had to learn a lot of stuff on the fly I had never known before. Assuming I can keep future scripts under control, there are three more episodes in the series yet to be made. One dealing with the accoutrement of Uranus and Neptune, their moons and rings. Another dealing with the little things, the comets and assorted bits of icy space junk that make up most of the water in our solar system. And a final episode taking us full circle and discussing the presence of water beyond our solar system. I will, however, be taking a bit of a break from this series for the next video, which will discuss the 50th anniversary of my favorite film of all time, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Farewell, my fellow seekers. Please like, comment, subscribe, and all that good stuff, and follow me on social media. I have links in the description. Hope to see you beyond the infinite.